Hi guys, so where I'm working today, I'm relaying some paving and part of the job is to lift the old paving and remove the mortar that it was laid with. And rather than have that waste product go off to landfill or pay for it to be disposed of somehow, I'm reusing it, I'm recycling it and I'm doing it by taking care of another problem. So you've no doubt seen me drive up and down this track several times and I bring feed up here for the pigs and all sorts of reasons to, to come up here and as you can see the track is a little bit muddy and it's not too bad now but in the winter it does actually get quite bad so whenever I see someone chopping down trees around power lines and things at the side of the road they use a chipper and they turn all that excess wood into wood chip and they need somewhere to get rid of it. And they're more than happy to give it away free if you've got somewhere local they can dump it. So whenever I see the utilities companies working and doing that kind of work near here, I use this track and say, come and dump your wood chip on our property because we've got a hundred uses for it, mostly as mulch. So they can't do that. If I see them in the winter, they can't get in here. So they have to either dump it right down the end by the road there, which means I've got to move it a hell of a long way, or they just won't be able to come. And there's a free resource there that I can't have. So I'm taking the old rubble, basically, that's broken up quite well, and I'm using it to reinforce our track. So you see here, I started a couple of days ago. And this is basically going to just break down into smaller pieces as I drive over it. This is just mortar and it will crumble a bit around the edges and over time it will get lovely and flat and it will just serve to shore up the, the tracks where the wheels go. So I'm killing two birds with one stone, if not more. So that's all done. And as you can see, it's another section of the track done. Probably done about half of the amount I would like to do this year, that'd be awesome. And as you can also see, it doesn't look very pretty. What's gonna happen next is obviously we'll use it, we'll drive over it, it'll break down a little bit. And then the next lot of wood chip that I managed to scavenge, we'll put a dusting of that over the top as well. So what's gonna happen is that'll, it'll look a bit nicer, it'll slowly break down, it'll eventually become soil. I don't think very much will grow in it because of the traffic, but nothing's growing in the mud now anyway. But it'll look like it looked before, but it'll just be solid. At least that's the plan. Okay, now I'm on my way back to site to collect another load I love I love doing things like this it it's recycling it's reusing something that would otherwise have it could have been reused it might have been turned into rubble or something but it's not really the stuff people seek because it's not concrete it's just going to turn to dust so you could recycle it it could have gone to landfill but what we're doing is we're recycling it as is without any additional mechanical inputs without any additional use of resources beyond obviously the small trip in the car and we're recycling it in a way where we're we're thinking forward we're doing ourselves something a favor that would potentially have cost a lot of money to have resolved another way it's you know it's everything it's everything I'm about so while it's not putting food on the table it's contributing to making the place we live and the place that we manage and the place that is producing our food making it that little bit more economic to run that little bit more convenient that little bit more sustainable and lowering the inputs in the future and that's what it's about lower those inputs increase those outputs so i've just got home now and uh, it rained all afternoon so i took my t-shirt off at the end of the day because it was so wet and i just put my dry coat on that was in the car it's quite a light coat so it felt so much better to get out of the rain but it's not raining at the moment Here's the hay we had delivered. So I'm gonna to have to move this. Obviously, if this gets wet, it'll get ruined. So we're gonna move that now and get it covered up. We're gonna move some of it next to the uh, hay rack and the rest into the shed. So what we'll do is we'll keep three or four bales near the hay rack there and then the rest in the shed. And these ones will have to be on a pallet and then covered over with a tarpaulin to keep them dry. So I'm just collecting a pallet for the, uh, the hay to go on. And I've stopped in my tracks because I've noticed that one of our charred plants is bolting so I'm gonna rip this center stem out and feed it to the pigs now actually I'm not gonna give it to the pigs I'm gonna give it to the chickens they haven't got much greenery in there 
For me personally, the jury is out on Swiss chard. You hear lots of reports. People grow it as an annual. People call it a biannual, which technically it is. But you also hear lots of reports of people growing it as a perennial, which certainly is our goal. At the moment, this is still in its first year, so I don't have much to report. They're gonna enjoy that. Look at them. They do have full, um, full feeders in there. You can see one there eating from the uh, treadle feeder just over there, look. But they do love some greenery and we do try and give them, you know, as much as we can. We certainly give them at least once a day a, a good dose of greenery. But um, back to chard. My goal is to grow it as a perennial and there are numerous reports of it being grown as a perennial. My brother-in-law claims to be growing it as a perennial um, and has done for several years. So that's our plan for this patch of chard. You all know my feelings about edible perennials. So this patch of chard up through here is supposed to be a perennial. That's, when I say supposed to be, that's why we planted it. We have planted this with the purpose of it being a perennial vegetable. So I will keep you guys informed as to how I get on. I will also go back to my literature. I've got a book that I, get a lot of my information on in regards to perennial vegetables and it's called perennial vegetables by martin crawford definitely one for your bookshelves um, i'm gonna consult with that tonight and then get back to you tomorrow on whatever i come up with there oh while we're on the subject of getting back to you i spent some time with my pig butchering book that i said i would and I still am undecided. I'm so keen to butcher them here for so many different reasons, for the efficacy for the pigs, for cost, so that I can say I've done it and I can do it. So I've learned that skill, but there's so many things that are making it difficult. So in an ideal world, I would butcher them or rather I'd slaughter them and then I'd half butcher them. I'd literally half the pig and then you'd put it in a fridge for 24 hours. Well, I don't have a fridge that we can put two half pigs in. So the long and the short of it is I am still undecided. I'm not, I'm coming girls. I am coming, I'm getting to you as soon as I can. Um, I'm still undecided because I'm trying to come up with some different ways of doing it. I need to do a little bit more research on butchering because I've only got one resource that I've really looked at so far and that is that book that I shared with you and as I said before I've been told it's very very good and it certainly gives you all the information you need but it only only shows you one way really and I think I need to do a little bit more research with regards to having the meat pass into rigor and that process really and the whole chilling process and, and the purpose of it and because basically the instructions if you like from that book and they are just one way of doing it but the instructions are half your pig and then you put it in the fridge for 24 hours then you take it out after it's cooled and then you butcher it i need to learn a little bit more about why and what other options i might have what's stopping me from butchering it straight away for example and I, i'm i'm taking a lot of my cues from field craft and and you know people that hunt and field dress animals they don't, they don't use uh, a fridge to do it so there's that in my mind and the other thing that is in my mind and that I don't want to dismiss is just waiting until it gets a bit colder and then effectively I can do it outside in a fridge in the fridge that is the world in the winter time but um, yeah so the long and the short of it is I'm still researching and I haven't decided yet but I will of course, keep you informed. I'm not happy that the, uh, the pallet's actually gonna keep them dry off the ground. So I'm gonna go and get two big, uh, big bits of timber. I've got two eight by eight somewhere lying around that I got from Freecycle. 
someone who had taken down a load of fencing and uh, had them left over. So I'm gonna go and grab those and use them as runners on the bottom just to lift it up that little bit higher. We've got 10 bales of hay. They cost three pound 50 each, so 35 quid. If I don't give them any hedging, one bale of hay will last maybe three days. So with the hedging, one bale of hay is gonna last a week on average. Now there'll be weeks when I don't have chance to do any hedging at this time of year, which is why we've got the hay. And there'll be weeks when I do a little bit extra, but on average, we're gonna go through just over a bale a week. So these 10 bales are gonna last us 10 weeks. Now, we've got a small amount of room in a shed, so we're gonna put six in there, I think. I'm gonna try and get six in there. And then four will go where I've just put them. And there's a very good reason for that, rather than putting them all just there on these pallets. And that's vermin. So vermin are gonna be able to use the space that I'm creating underneath these hay bales as a lovely warm nesting spot. And that's the last thing I want. So by only placing four, four of the bales there, then obviously what that means is in, in a much shorter time, they'll be finished and then we'll move everything. We'll move the, uh, the hay rack as well. And we'll set up with the next few bales of hay somewhere else. The other thing is actually that we would like to move the hay rack quite often anyway, uh, for two reasons. I've spoke to you quite often about breaking the parasitic cycle of things like worms in our stock and you can keep that down just by trying to reduce the number of spaces even within their pens that they spend a lot of time that's one thing um, and also they do leave a fair amount so it stops a big build up of waste on the ground it allows me to pick it up and get it composted and just you know keep on top of things that little bit better I've also had some more excellent results in the last few days. Our pair of meat birds, if you remember, that we rescued from basically a, a chicken meat rearing production. The female is laying eggs, lots of them, pretty much an egg every day. And that is phenomenal news. So we're going to be putting some of those in the incubator very very soon as soon as I get chance basically and uh, it's really just a question of whether or not the the male is is doing his job and uh, if he is then we're gonna have lots of meat chicks which is fantastic news it really is great news so yeah more to more to do more to keep you up to date with and I obviously will be doing that there we go I'm much happier with that now you can see that's nicely off the ground. So we'll put these in, take the rest over to the shed and then we'll get this covered up with a tarp. So my wife's just reminded me actually that we've got this spare chicken house that we can use to store the hay in, which is much closer to the goats. So I'm gonna put it in there. So this was used by our chickens up until sometime in the spring. I made a huge error when building this house. I was, I was so proud of it because I built it all out of tip materials that I'd scavenged. Even these metal roof sheets, I'd got these from FreeCycle. Um, I built the perches, as you can see, out of just sticks that we had lying around. And yeah, just super happy with this. Even these big posts were reclaimed. They were, uh, I don't know where I got them, whether it was FreeCycle or somewhere like that, but this was all built for free. But I made a huge mistake and that I only put one door and whereas what I should have done is put three, one on each side because, and, and of course I can alter that, I can sort that out. But what we can do when I, when I cut three doors, I can have it next time so that the chickens come out of this side and have their run over here. Then when they've sort of chewed up the ground here, I can make them come out of this door and they can come around here and then the same on the third side to give it's all about giving the ground a break because the reason there's nothing in it now is because they beat this ground up terribly um as you can see you know they killed off everything here by the door 
and all we've got now is a load of weeds coming in and taking over and that's partly my fault that I didn't get around to seeding it in time but seeding this is definitely high up on my list to seed these areas where we've still got the clear ground I won't spray it what I will do I will cut it with the mower several times I'll get the goats in here they'll eat some of the weeds back and we'll just gradually bring this back to grass by constantly mowing seeding and uh using the goats but eventually we'll clear that but ultimately what it means is that for the next couple of months we've got this space so i'm going to be able to use this to store my hay just on my way to pick up the uh the tarpauling to cover the the outside hay and i've just noticed look at look at this isn't this exciting some of our grapes are just starting to blush can you see you see there, look that one. Look how excited I am over one grape going slightly purple. But uh, yeah, very exciting because this will be our first real harvest of grapes. And there are, in all seriousness, without exaggerating, there are probably over a hundred bunches on this little trellis here. So yeah, super excited. Not entirely sure what we're going to do with them. My son, my youngest son, will certainly eat a fair few of them because he loves them. But because they're small, they're small grapes and they have a pip in, they have a seed, uh, they don't really lend themselves too well to the fruit bowl. Obviously, they, you know, some will go that way. But I'm not sure whether we'll juice them or use them for something else. We don't drink. We don't have any particular interest in making wine. Although I haven't ruled that out. I don't know if a hundred small bunches like this is enough to warrant the effort. But uh, yeah, I'm excited nonetheless, even though I'm not sure what the ultimate use of them will be. As much as anything else, I'm excited because this is a plant that we found. You know, this was an abandoned plant that was just under the ground, covered in weeds. And now look at it. And uh, we're getting all these grapes off it. Brilliant. Anyway, let me get that tarpaulin. There we go. That's a good job done. Very happy now. And looks like just in time. So I've got so much coming up to share with you guys. We're gonna do a harvest of a little orchard that we have access to, and we're gonna do some soft fruit preserving. We're gonna preserve some pears and plums in like a sugar syrup. Like if you buy tinned fruit, in the shop so that's coming up i'm also going to spend some time with you up in my food forest or what will eventually be the food forest i'm going to talk to you about everything i've planted why i've planted it um, and what the plans are for future planting up there also got to do some general maintenance up there um, we've got to fell a load of trees i'll bring you guys all along with me on that obviously and also spend some time showing you my herb spiral and explaining how I built it, how easy they are to build, the advantages of having one. In fact, I can quickly show you it now. It's just there, look, in the middle of the lawn, next to the cart. And that's just brimming with herbs. It's in the lawn, it's outside our kitchen door, so it's super handy for the kitchen. And of course, with the time of year being what it is, there's also going to be lots and lots of mushroom foraging and other foraging videos coming up. At the moment, I'm working uh, my nine to five job that kind of pays the bills is uh, really quite demanding at the moment so I'm not able to do a lot of the stuff that I'd like to be doing and it's quite frustrating but that is life and striking that balance is an important part of, of what we have to do so that'll wrap it up for today and I will speak to you tomorrow